distinguished members on the dais, august members in the audience, proud parents, friends from the corporate sector, students who have just graduated and taken up placements in different outfits in the corporate sector, and equally importantly, Ms. Rama, who is the president of the Electronic City uh, Township, <laughs> who is also gracing the occasion. Uh, a very good afternoon to each one of you. At the outset, I think we must, on behalf of everyone in the staff, in the faculty, uh, congratulate each one of the graduates who have got their degrees from this esteemed institution and will play a very important role in the next 30 to 40 years in shaping the future of the country. I think as we all know, India today produces the largest number of engineers and MBAs in the world. Not only that, the number of engineers that we produce, 15 lakhs every year, the number of MBAs that we produce every year, 3 lakhs every year, is more than the combined number of engineers and MBAs produced by China and USA. That's the kind of, that's the kind of churning out of numbers that we are doing uh, in the country today. But, you know, there are multiple tipping points when it comes to the intersection between employment and employability. And I personally feel one of the primary reasons why is it that we are not in a position to meet the aspirations of the students who get out of all the colleges in the country is that, you know, we are very, very weak on apprenticeship. Fortunately for the students getting out of this college, I think apprenticeship is a part and parcel of your agenda, part and part of your curriculum you will be surprised to know that the total number of apprenticeships in India, I'm talking of North Karnataka, in India, is just 3 lakhs every year. 3 lakhs for a population of 1.2 billion. In Germany, with a, with a population of less than 10% of that we have, there are 40 lakhs apprenticeships. Japan has a crore. China has 1.5 crores. Because in case we confine ourselves to the classrooms without being hands-on, I don't think it will take us too far. My passion, and I very sincerely and passionately believe that technology has answers for all the questions. All the problems and everything that you can think of that India should be in the days to come, in the weeks to come, in the years to come, in the generations to come. Why I'm saying this? We are dealing in India with numbers. You go to a ration shop, you go to an Adha service counter, you go to admission for a particular college, school, or whatever, we are dealing with numbers. In this August audience, all of us have deep pockets. When I say deep pockets, we can afford a ration card, we can afford a driving license, okay, using means which are not ethical. Not that we are using it, but what I mean to say is we have the capacity to do that, very unfortunately. But 80 to 85 percent of the population in the country don't have that capacity. So I personally and passionately believe that technology is the only option to reach the last person in the queue. Because you and I are meant to ensure that the comforts, the luxuries, and the absolute necessities that you enjoy, we enjoy every day, is also available to the last person in the queue. And technology is the only answer to this. I have a very small video of five and a half minutes. I think with your permission, I would like to play that video, primarily because you know it tells you where we are today in terms of technology, where we are going to be in the next generation, maybe we are going to be in the next you know, five years, 10 years, and so on and so forth. It's a beautiful video. It was presented in the Paris animation show. You know, Paris uh, happens to be the destination for uh, you know, uh, animation and gaming. Uh, there's an annual event, and this uh, uh, video clipping was shown as a part of the uh, animation event, which again tries to tell you where we are today in terms of technology, which focuses more on wireless, because that's the future, uh, and where we are going to be in the next decade, where we are going to be in 2020 and 2025. But it also tells you 
that the way humankind's knowledge is increasing, the rate at which it is increasing, you will not believe it. You know, the, when I talk of mankind's knowledge, the total repertoire of knowledge that mankind has throughout the world, you know, it's doubling over a certain period of time. About 140 years ago, it used to double every 30 years because technology was not available to the extent that we have today. World War I, it used to double every 17 years. World War II, maybe every 11 years. 1963, for which year the data is available, it used to double every seven years. You know, today, what is the rate at which mankind's knowledge is doubling? Information is doubling. Any, you can hazard a guess. The rate at which the total information available, knowledge available to mankind is doubling. If it was 30 years, 17 years, 11 years, today it is doubling every six weeks. So what it means is that I have taken a degree today or I have gotten to the first semester and six weeks down the line, okay, whatever I have learned has already become obsolete because something more to it. So this video very briefly tells you, it's a five minute video. Uh, I uh, urge your patience because I personally think it tells a lot about where we are today and we, have, we are going to be, uh, you know, five years, 10 years down the line.
that's where the technology is taking all of us. That's a kind of, you know, the focuses on wireless, focuses on a single gadget meeting all your requirements. You will always hear, you know, thoughts, suggestions, you know, in the newspapers, in the periodicals, saying that the pace at which technology is growing, the pace at which innovations are taking place is slowing down. In my view, it depends on what do you mean by innovations, what do you mean by the kind of technological growth that you have in mind. If you are looking at you know, a world of atoms, which is physical, yes, there is a slowdown. If you are looking at innovation or technology in terms of world of bits, software, it is growing at an accelerating rate. Now, why is it that some people still say that the innovations are not taking place at the rate at which it should be or at the rate at which we expect it to be. The reason is that, you know, look at the Boeing 747. It has been with us since 1969. We still use Boeing 747, of course. There are changes taking place with regard to fuel efficiency and so on and so forth, but we still have the Boeing 747 developed in 69. We still have an automobile which goes at 70 mph or 120 plus kilometers per hour. But why is it that? No growth is taking place. Now, that's because we are looking at technology or innovation in the physical space, in the atom space. Look at technology in the bit space in the software program. A cell phone was as big as a brick about 30 years ago. And today, a cell phone is just not a cell phone. I mean, you know, it, it, it is now a very important medical diagnostic tool. I'll just give you a couple of examples on where technology is leading us to. About uh, six months ago, Harvard University and MIT set up a new enterprise. It's called EDX. I don't know if anybody, anybody has heard of EDX. It's capital E, small d, capital X. Now, just go to edx.com on Google. You will get everything about what EDX is. You know, it's a revolution in trying to evaluate papers. Why I'm giving you these examples is that we have students and faculty out here. Now, this is a new enterprise started by Harvard University and MIT, which permits you to correct the answer scripts in seconds. You know, till now, we had two false papers could be corrected, you know, uh, using computer optics and so on. Uh, we could have true false, we could have numerical based qu questions, but this is an essay type correcting enterprise. You know, you write an essay on a topic it be, which is given to you, this EDX system corrects it in a couple of seconds and gives back to you the kind of feedback that you're expecting. Now, immediately thereafter, you can rewrite the answer paper and get a much better grade. Now, that's the kind of scenario that we are looking at the next five years, 10 years. Now, though developed by Harvard University and MIT, it has already been adopted by University of California, Georgetown, Texas, Berkeley, and so on and so forth in USA, despite a lot of stiff opposition. And you know, they try to compare the grades given by this computerized EDX system with the manual system. In fact, the computerized system was much better because it was, it was agnostic to a lot of values that we entertain, we have embedded in our minds. So, that's the kind of scenario that you'll have in the next five years, 10 years, and so on. Another very important problem, you know, which every parent faces is about, are the examinations going to take place on time? How do I ensure that there is no paper leakage? You know, we have technologies today, which in a particular examination center, I can print 10,000 question papers in less than a minute. If, a, if an examination center has 10,000 students taking a particular paper, there is technology available where the question paper is prepared through a question bank by a system which is as big as a HP printer. It will print 10,000 question papers to you just five minutes before the examination starts. So what is the possibility of leakage? Literally zero. So that's the kind of scenario that we have today, already being used in very many countries. Thirdly and very importantly, there is a Bangalore-based company you must have heard of a company by name Merit Track, which has now been taken over by another company, uh, Manipal. Today, Manipal has developed a system and an application whereby, suppose I write a, an essay type uh, you know, uh, answer paper, be it mechanical engineering, electronics, communication, or whatever. The answer sheet is scanned. And once it is scanned, it is given to a professor in Timbuktu, it is given to a professor in Bangalore, it is given to a professor in States, and so on and so forth. And you get back the corrected answer script in about a week's time. Even if you don't want to adopt technology to the hill, this is a technology being de which has been developed by uh, you know, Merit Track. And you will not believe it, the first adopter of this technology was none other than Cambridge University. 
So wherein, you know, a lakh and 20,000 students who take the examination, their answer scripts are scanned uh, on in, you know, as soon as the examination is over. And, you know, today, you don't have to hunt for professors to correct your answer scripts. So professors going on strike just before the evaluation takes place because they want a hike in their remuneration and compensation package, which is what we see on almost on a daily basis, uh, you know, throughout the country. So this system permits you to engage professors across the globe. Why should it be only within the country? The best of the brains who are good in there are different verticals. They are giving these uh, answer scripts who try to you know, evaluate it and send it back. So the entire results, even if you don't use te you know, uh, the kind of technology that EDX has in position, you are in a position to declare the results in about a week's time. So that's the kind of technology that we are moving into. Now, the question is, why is it that we are not in a position to do as much as we aspire or as much as people aspire or as much as the country deserves or needs uh, looking at the kind of growth scenario that we have in mind? Now, there are very many reasons, but suffice it to say that if we use technology, as I said, we are in a position to ensure that we have answers to all the questions. I'll ask you a very simple question. You know, everyone says, you know, in government what happens is a lot of corruption, and, you know, if you want to get things done, you have to pay money, you have to pay bribes, and so on and so forth, which to some extent is true, but not to a large extent. Again, you know, in case you want to address this issue, we have such I mean, absolutely immaculate technology application. The only thing is we are very, very hesitant to adopt them. Now, take the example, you know, India today has 643 villages. I'm sorry, districts, 643 districts. When I say a district, Bangalore is a district, Karnataka has 30 districts. Now, similarly, uh, in 28 states and 35 states and union territories, we have 643 districts. Now, any guess, what is the amount spent in every district in India. I'm talking about an average figure. It could be X crores in one district. It could be uh, three times X in another district. What is the amount spent? You know, when I say amount spent, it could be for drinking water. It could be for laying roads. It could be for paying salaries to teachers. The entire expenditure that the district incurs in India on an average. Just give me a ballpark figure. I hope you know what I mean. Now, what is the amount spent in a district? Uh, give me an average figure with 643 districts. It'll be mind-boggling, huh? If, sorry? That'll be a bit, uh, you know, uh, I'm talking of one district. Uh, you know, I'm quoting you the uh, published figures uh, of the government, not of government of Karnataka, but Planning Commission. Uh, it's on the web, you can check it out. It's about 1,300 crores every year. And I imagine if that kind of money to be given to every graduate who is passing out today, you will remove poverty overnight. Okay, but why is it not happening? Okay, now, if you are spending 1,300 crores every year in every district, 1,300 multiplied by 643, and still we say that 24 to 25% per of the population is below the poverty line, we are not in a position to give them two square meals a day. It's a shame on us. I personally feel it's a shame on me. Personally, because, you know, reason we don't adopt technology. We have technologies which will ensure. Now, today what's happening, you lay the same road, you sink the same bore well, you construct the same house over and over again, year after year, year after year. Okay? We have absolutely immaculate, tested technologies, you know, using spatial data, whereas, wherein we can ensure that this does not happen. But people don't want to do it because you and I have a vested interest in continuing with the existing system. And you and I are here to ensure that we break this vested interest and ensure that we use technology to the hilt. There are very many examples, you know. People talk of, you know, uh, you must have heard of, uh, you know, uh, countries like USA and in the Middle East who try to uh, meet practically 80 to 90 percent of the global demand of petroleum and petroleum related products. Today, our total import bill on petroleum is close to about a lakh and 30,000 crores. On food, is it's another a lakh and 30,000 crores. Now, why I'm giving you all these examples is whose money is this? It's your money. It's your taxpayers. It's the taxpayers' money. It's your money. Now, if it's your money, I mean, it is, I mean, it's your right to ensure that it is spent judiciously it is spent in the way it ought to be spent. You don't mind, you know, subsidizing the poor because that's my intention, that's your intention. But the subsidy should reach the poor. Okay, for every gas cylinder that we use at, at home, there is a subsidy of 400 rupees. You and I don't require the subsidy, but let it go to the person who deserves it, who needs it, and who requires it. Now, as I see, it's only the technology which has answers to 
all these questions. And I passionately believe that you know, if we give technology a chance, we will be in a position to ensure that we meet the requirements, we meet the needs, and we meet you know, the growing aspirations of the future generations. Because our duty is to ensure, as Mr. Harish was mentioning, uh, the work-life balance. There will be no life unless you work today. And if you want to work today, in my, in my view, uh, we need to use technology to the hilt. Finally, uh, we are doing a lot to ensure that uh, you know, the kind of uh, ecosystem that we have in Bangalore, uh, we are doing our best to ensure that we try to encash on the existing ecosystem and also uh, enrich it further to get the best of breed solutions in technology and different applications. Uh, we are, you know, building. We are very good in software, but not so good in hardware. So we are trying to do something, trying to get hardware from other countries who are doing very well, especially countries like uh, Taiwan and Israel. Uh, we are building an exclusive business park for Taiwanese industries. Hopefully, it should become a reality sooner than later. But opportunities are plenty. Okay, so much so that you go to any of the big industrial areas, you know, you will, every unit will have a wanted board. I want X, Y, Z with so many, uh, this kind of skill set. I want A, B, C, D, E with these kinds of skill sets. So when so many kinds of opportunities are available, I think it's our duty to ensure that we exploit them, we explore them, and ensure that it's also available for the generations uh, to come. Now. We also need to pay equal amount of research. This will be my last point. We need to pay an equally important role to our research. Uh, again, you may not know this figure, but uh, uh, Bangalore alone, I'm talking of Bangalore of 728 square kilometers, has 396 R&D labs. It's the highest in the country. And you look at the next city in the country which, with R&D labs, it is Pune with 107. And look at the gap, 396 and 107. And national capital territory of Delhi, it is 103. So with this kind of uh, a very rich system to harness, to harvest, and to promote research and development, we are uh, doing a lot. Uh, as I said, you know, trying to see in case we can become a hardware hub as we are a software hub today uh, with assistance from countries like, uh, you know, Japan, countries like uh, Israel, countries like Taiwan, you know, who are very keen on ensuring that, you know, their footprints, you know, the, the investors and companies from these countries' footprints in Karnataka are enhanced. So we are taking a number of initiatives. But you know, uh, the ultimate is you know a small. This example I share it in a lot of gatherings. A small country like uh, Taiwan, which has a population of 23 million, 2.3 crores, uh, about 1,500 square kilometers, almost twice uh, the size of Bangalore. It produces three U.S. patents every day. Mind-boggling figure. And we produce perhaps. Uh, you know, uh, 300 patents or 290 plus patents every year. Uh, and Taiwan, a small country, produces three U.S. patents every day. And it has 47,000 patents below the belt. So that's the kind of ecosystem that we are looking at to be replicated in the state with help from uh, institutions like ISBR, uh, the corporates, uh, and the academia. Uh, we are trying to see how best we can replicate that ecosystem to ensure. Uh, you know, the beauty of the Taiwanese example is that it's the startup paradise uh, in the world. Suppose today you want to start a new unit. And I'm just giving an example. You want a cell phone with five cameras. You, if you were to do that in any other country, you know, you, you'll require a lot of backing from venture capitalists and angel investors and so on and so forth. But in Taiwan, you make an application to a particular body. That body is called ITRI. You make an application saying that you want a cell phone which has five cameras. It's a given to you in six months' time. That's the kind of you know, uh, ecosystem that we have. And that's the kind of ecosystem they try to replicate. Of course, it's not possible overnight. But there are certain things which we can learn from these countries, from these examples globally, and try to see how best we can fast track and turbocharge our economy to meet the aspirations of this generation and the present generation. Uh, finally, I'm sure you know in the days to come and the weeks to come and the years to come, you will have some days which are very good and you will be very happy, some days which are not so good, which will give you experience. And in my view, both are very important to ensure that uh, you live up to the expectations of uh, all your well-wishers. So I take this opportunity once again uh, to wish you the very best in all walks of life that you are going to uh, in the days, weeks, and years to come. You will certainly live up to the expectations of all your well-wishers. And most importantly, 
uh, you as a citizen of the country, having taken the oath uh, a short while ago, will be role models for the rest in the country, in the state, and wherever you are. And you will do your best to take the best step forward in your life and become role models, as I said, become role models for everybody else. Uh, may God always be with you. And uh, I pray, also pray that may God always be with you and uh, uh, guide you in all your endeavors. Appreciate your patience and appreciate your time. Thanks very much. <laughs>